I'm joined today by a very distinguished guest, uh, Mr. Tundu Lisu from uh, Tanzania and now living in Belgium. And he's the uh, vice chairman of the opposition party Chadema and was also a presidential candidate. And uh, he's, been, he's been joined by a delegation from Tanzania, uh, from the party, from different youth uh, organizations. Uh, and we are basically also want to uh, discuss with you what has changed in Tanzania. So um, since 2015 and then also since um, the death of President Magufuli. So if you want to introduce, uh, introduce yourself as a, a little bit as well, uh, we're waiting for uh, a lot of interesting news uh, that we're going to discuss as well together today. And uh, you're very welcome. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, basically, you have uh, you have basically introduced me to your audience. Um, <laughs> you told them my name, my party position. Um, I was a presidential candidate in the last general election, as you say. Uh, prior to uh, 2020, I was a member of parliament for the opposition Chadema, which is the largest opposition party in Tanzania since um, 2010. So I was elected twice uh, to represent a constituency in central Tanzania. Uh, my second stint in parliament was cut short on September 7, when gunmen sent by the former president John Pombe Magufuli to kill me tried to do so. And I've been living in Tanzania, uh, outside Tanzania ever since. Um, I was airlifted to Kenya where I was in hospital for four months and then since early January of 2018 I was brought to um, Belgium for further treatment and then I went back to Tanzania in July of 2020 to participate in the general elections in which I was um, honored to represent my party as a presidential candidate and soon after the uh, election I was forced to flee the country again. And so I've been in Belgium since November of 2020, um, up, up to now. Now you ask what has changed since 2015, and uh, especially what has changed since March of last year. In, 20, in, in, the last, in the general election of 2015, uh, Tanzania elected um, a new president by the name of John Pombe Magufuli. And the country descended into a reign of terror, the likes of which have never been seen in our country's history. Uh, president Magufuli declared openly uh, in February of 2016, that he would see to it that by the year 2020, there would be no opposition party in Tanzania. Uh, on, in the same speech, he also said he did not want to see any political meeting by an opposition political party. What followed after those public pronouncements was a reign of terror. Our members, leaders, up and across the country were targeted for particularly brutal repression. Uh, the kind of brutal repression which saw me shot multiple times and nearly killed. Um, others of our members and leaders were less fortunate. I was, I was fortunate, I'm still here. But many did not make it. They were not as fortunate. So we have had people who were murdered in broad daylight. Uh, we have people who have been, who were abducted by the security forces and they've disappeared without trace to this day. We have hundreds of people who were arrested illegally, uh, tortured in police cells, um, charged in, in com with completely spurious criminal charges. Um, our national chairman, uh, who should have been here with us during this trip, was arrested and charged with uh, terrorism and spent eight months in prison. And then they just released him and without any, any, any explanation. So went through hell. And that was after, after 2015. 
in March of this year, in 2020, um, before I come to March of, of last year, in 2020, uh, President Magufuli rigged his way back to power. Uh, that, that is the election I, I stood as a, as a presidential candidate. And uh, a, a few months later, he was dead. A COVID denier who thought that we, Tanzania could pray its way out of the pandemic. And therefore, he didn't take any of the, you know, the pro precautions that doctors were telling the rest of the world to follow. President Magufuli didn't, and he prohibited any other Tanzanian from following those uh, uh, precautions. And finally, COVID caught up with him, and he died in March of 20, uh, 2021, last year. Uh, so... What has changed since March of 2021 is that we have a new president. Uh, her name is, we have a new, a woman president for that matter. Her name is uh, Samia Sulu Hassan. Uh, and when she came into office, uh, there was a lot of optimism. There was a huge uh, sigh of relief, a collective national sigh of relief that the dark, long night of the Magufuli, Magufuli terror was finally over. There was hope and optimism that uh, the new president would usher in a new chapter in our national uh, life. Um, and to be fair to her, uh, some things have changed. The political tone changed. Uh, hers is a gentler, motherly tone. Um, hers is a very smiling face. She's saying all the the, the right things, uh, and, and so things have changed. Uh, hundreds of uh, political prisoners, mostly from our party, who were in various prisons in the country, have largely been uh, released. There, are, there may be a few still um, in prison, but. Uh, it would be correct to say must have been released. And the new president has also started uh, talking to the opposition, which her predecessor had pledged in public to crush and to destroy. Uh, Samia Sulu Hassan is talking to us, and, and that is important. All these uh, changes that have, have taken place are important. The question is, is that all? Are they sufficient? And our answer to this important question is, uh, these changes, however welcome, are not at all sufficient. Uh, the, we had a, a, a dictatorship under Magufuli, and we have had a very repressive political system for many, many years since independence for the simple reason that the Tanzanian state and its institutions were built, were created in the era of one party rule in the 60s and 70s. And that state and its institutions, as, as reflected in the country's constitution, has remained largely intact in the era of multi-party uh, system. So we have, we have a multi-party system where we are theoretically allowed to compete in th free and fair elections, but in reality, the constitutional order which is in place and the institutions that manage this constitutional order are institutions of a one-party state. If I give an example of our electoral system, which is the most problematic area for us as a political party, we have a political, a, an electoral system which is totally dominated by the president, and therefore, because a, a Tanzanian president has always been a chairperson of the ruling party, and therefore the, our electoral system is totally controlled by the ruling party. 
and this electoral system and its institutions are supposed to deliver free, fair, and credible elections. It is impossible. It has been proved to be impossible. And so where we are today, after, with the, after President Magufuli passed, we have a system which is basically the same system that Magufuli used to, want to try and destroy us. Only now that it is managed by a smiling president as opposed to a snarling president. Uh, we have a Magufulista in President Samia Sulu Hassan. She's a Magufulista with a smile. We had a snarling president in the person of John Pombe Magufuli. The institutions and the state that they, are preside, they preside over is the same authoritarian state of old. And this is where this is the, where the central problem is. And therefore, what we want to see is democratic reforms which will move us away from this anti-democratic authoritarian state into a democratic, responsible, and accountable state. Uh, in which the Tanzanian people will be able to elect their leaders and representatives in free, fair, and credible elections. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, actually, when we were this morning um, with the different institutions, uh, you also mentioned, for example, that we can see a change of faces, but not really a change of power. And what I found also interesting was that we talked a lot about Uh, economic reform versus constitutional reform and where you said okay we actually been told this lie for 60 years that once economic reform is established that we can come to constitutional reform so my question would be also how can the european union and especially we as western uh, representatives how can we support you in your mission also to get to this system of, of free and fair elections I think you, the point you raise about uh, economics, economic development, economic prosperity and stability uh, before democratic reforms, uh, this is what I, I, I referred to in the one or two meetings that we held in here in Brussels. Um, uh, I called it, that is a 60-year-old lie. And I think your, 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 your listeners would like to know why do I say that. Uh, in 1962, a year after independence, because we, we, became, we got independence in 1961. Now within a year of our independence, we changed the constitution and our political system from a democratic parliamentary system Uh, a system which has been hailed in, in, in political literature of the period as a fairly uh, democratic system that we inherited uh, 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 ironically from the British colonial state. But within a year it was changed into the presidential system. The, we, this system which has been described as imperial presidency. Our presidents became so powerful they are akin to 18th century absolute uh, monarchs of, of, of Europe of, of, of that period. Now the argument that was used to create this uh, imperial presidents was economic development. So we were told we are a poor country We've just got an independence. We need to develop and develop very fast. As our, our founding president would say, we need to run while others are walking. And to run meant giving the government and the state enormous powers which would be able to transform the country within a short period of time. And therefore... We were told the argument went that uh, a democracy, a democratic constitution, 
which goes hand in hand with a bill of rights and rule of law and an independent judiciary. These are the kind of uh, uh, democratic luxuries that can only be afforded by rich, developed countries. For a poor country like Tanganyika, we were Tanganyika then, we were told we cannot afford these luxuries. We cannot afford democracy or human rights or good governance because we needed to develop. The country needed economic transformation. And therefore, so, so that was 1962, 60 years ago. Of course, by the mid, by the, the 80s, 20 years after independence, it was very clear to anyone who cared to look at that we neither had development we were promised, nor did we have the rights and democracy which we were told we didn't need because we needed development. But instead, we had an overbearing state. We had a, a government that had become so dominant in, the, in our lives that you did not leave the government chose what you wore, which school you went, how you were paid, who it, it, our lives were totally dominated by this authoritarian uh, state. And of course, um, authoritarian states tend to be very, not only autocratic, but they are also very inefficient. So someone like me grew up as, as a teenager, I grew up in a Tanzania that uh, queuing for almost every essential commodity was the norm. So there was not enough sugar, there was not enough soap, there was n everything you had to queue uh, for uh, because this authoritarian system which controlled everything was also very inefficient. It was very brutal, absolutely. Uh, but it was, it was also totally inefficient in, in its management of the economy. So today... Uh, after all these years, the new president comes after we have suffered for five years under the Magufuli dictatorship, and instead of carrying out democratic reforms, she tells us that, well, constitutional reform is not her agenda. Her agenda is national economic transformation. And we rightly, I believe, we rightly told her that well, we had that lie 60 years ago, give us a break. And of course, we, some of us paid a very heavy price because of, of that. Our, my, my national chairman was arrested and charged with uh, completely bogus terrorism, terrorism charges and he spent eight months in prison. So when we say democratic reforms, constitutional reforms, we have a history which suggests that without democratic uh, reforms, without building democratic structures, which will ensure the government is accountable to the people, then we might as well forget economic transformation. We have our history to prove that. 